It's never happened before and probably never will again. But on February 9th, 2006, ABC sports commentator Al Michaels was traded to NBC for a cartoon character, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And so, after nearly 80 years, the Disney studio finally took custody of Walt Disney's long lost cartoon personality. Lo and behold, we were able to negotiate a fair trade, and as part of the deal, Oswald the Rabbit came back to Disney. Little did I know how much attention it was going to get. The reaction was huge. Even Al Michaels sent me a note, kind of in disbelief, <laughs> that Oswald had gotten so much more attention than he had gotten. I was just amazed that that subject had even come up, you know, of getting all this Oswald material back. I knew that it existed over there at Universal, but the notion of trading it for an announcer <laughs> was really kind of fun. I really wanted to complete Walt's mission, so to speak, even though Walt had a lot of ideas that were not fulfilled when he died in 1966. But I knew that there was always kind of an empty spot in his heart since Oswald left. And there was something about bringing Oswald back that seemed right, going kind to of bring Oswald back to his rightful place. And so the move was meant to do something that was positive for Disney's culture and to be able to tap into some of that legacy. During the 1920s, a group of young animators in Hollywood, California, were navigating their way through uncharted waters in the animation business. The early Walt Disney Studio was headed by 25-year-old Walt Disney, his brother Roy Disney, and chief animator Ub Iwerks. The passion that Walt and Ub shared for the art of animation was unbridled. I think they were both awed by the animation art that they saw when they were young kids, when they were teenagers, and went and saw these very early attempts at cartoons. And they were both artistic, both artists, and this could be really fun. They were just a really teeny weeny little group of people, you know. My, my dad, of course, was in the other office trying to find the money for these guys to work with. But uh, certainly Walt and Ub and, and a very few other people must have been a really tight little group that, that was having a lot of fun doing what they were doing. Their first successful series, the Alice Comedies, placed a live action girl in a cartoon environment. The pioneering series ran three years and spanned 23 cartoons. But by 1927, increasing costs and technical restrictions prompted Walt and his brother Roy to seek out new creative opportunities. Disney, through his distributor, got a contract at Universal. And Universal wanted a new character to replace Alice and Julius, the cartoon characters that had brought Disney to Universal's attention. Disney, wanting to go into a new direction, simply wanted to eliminate the live-action components altogether that had defined Alice and go for an all-animated look. It became a collaboration between Disney and iWorks to come up with a new character, and the result was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Universal's chairman Carl Lemley and production head P.D. Cochran enlisted Walt and his staff to make 26 cartoons that would star a rabbit. This irascible, mischievous, and fun-loving rabbit, soon named Oswald, hit movie screens across the country over the next two years and rivaled some of the biggest cartoon and live-action stars of the day, including Felix the Cat and Coco the Clown. For 75 years, Disney's version of Oswald has remained virtually unknown to the general public, privy only to a handful of film buffs and historians. I heard about him all my life. He's, like Mickey, a little older than me. <laughs> And even older than Mickey, of course, I've now seen a few Oswalds. To bring them back and to see that much further back into our history, it's really fun to know where you came from, in a way. There's something so pure about them. They're good, they're simple, both in terms of message and in terms of animation itself. But you can see early signs of genius not just in the animation itself, but in the use of characters in animation. One of the things Walt brought was the notion that the characters had real personalities to, for the audience to identify with, where so many early cartoons were more about the gags than about personalities. Your early stuff was 
Pratt Falls, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, physical humor, both my mother and father loved to see people take funny falls, even in life, even when it happened to me. <laughs> I think the most exciting thing is to see how Disney's sense of story develops and how he starts working towards what today we would call situational comedy as opposed to old-fashioned slapstick. Dad would, uh, was a lousy joke teller, but a lot of comedy just out of human behavior. Family, funny things that little kids would say became a very big part of our family vocabulary but he would relate things that had happened to somebody and he laughed so much that he would have tears coming down his cheeks, you know, in, in some instances. Walt and Ub would take animation to places the medium hadn't gone before. Their joint explorations in developing personality gags and a more emboldened graphic style soon put their second cartoon, Trolley Troubles, on the animation map. Um, Iwerks animated the entire cartoon of Trolley Trouble. And there's some wonderful perspective effects in it of the trolley like going forwards and back and, and the tracks going like this and it's skipping from hill to hill. He cut so many shots together. There's some great stuff of him going through one tunnel after another with the little window of the next tunnel coming up. That's very ingenious. Simply done, but, but it's very effective. It makes you feel like you're in the trolley car with him. Oswald was patterned very much after Doug Fairbanks, because uh, Fairbanks was very uh, popular in the 20s. And in uh, Oh What a Night, which is one of the best Oswalds, I think, and I think of Iwerks animated this sequence, he's fighting off the villain in a sword fight. And every once in a while, he just interrupts his sword play to go in the room where his girlfriend's tied up and he kisses her <laughs> and goes back to the sword fight again. And that has a, a lot of interesting quality. A comic hero, that's what Oswald was. There's a lot of steps forward in pantomime acting. So they were really getting sharp at communicating just with poses and actions what the characters want and what they're thinking, too. Oswald did a lot of funny stuff, too, with frustration comedy. Like in Mechanical Cow, he's trying to get the cow out of bed in the morning. It's a very simple thing, but the cow's too lazy. So he pushes and pushes. And finally, he, in frustration, he's tearing at his hair and, and like trotting back and forth. And it's really great. It's a little cycle, but it's very effective emotionally. Oswald was always trying to get something to happen, and a lot of times he'd be frustrated. The amount of work they did and the level of it was astonishingly good and turning them out at some incredible rate still it amazes me that in two weeks they could make a show you know you know you always think about those shows like a year at least considered by many of his peers to be the top animator of his day ub's skills at sheer draftsmanship and speed allowed the Disney studio to complete one full cartoon every two weeks, a pace unheard of in today's world. This is a nationwide distributor. It's Universal Pictures. It's one of the largest companies operating at that time. And suddenly, they have a celebrity on their hands. Anything having to do with movies in the 20s is going to give you some fame but nothing of this dimension. For the first time, Disney's exposed to the world of merchandising with candy and pins and other tie-ins that were actively promoted by Universal. They did a stencil set, which is highly prized today, it goes for many thousand dollars. And there was a chocolate bar, an Oswald chocolate bar. I bet you can't find any of those <laughs> that haven't melted by now. Universal pushed Oswald onto the world stage. He was embraced by audiences around the globe and drew the admiration of key New York animators when he made his debut at the famed Colony Theater on Broadway. The budget for the Oswalds was significantly greater than the budgets for the Alices. I think it was something like 2250 a cartoon, 
which would have been a handsome fee for someone who hadn't been established as Coco the Clown or Felix had become. Their whole philosophy was, you know, it's five minutes of entertainment and five minutes of, of laughs and fun and jokes and nothing else. That's what they were there for, to make people laugh and have a little fun for a few minutes. In the spring of 1928, with the series going strong, Walt traveled to New York City to negotiate a more profitable contract with his distributor, Charles Mintz. What Walt never expected was the underhanded deal that Mintz had in store for him. As was the custom back then, as the distributor owned the copyright to the character, Disney, from all we can tell, was content without arrangement, not understanding, I think at the time, what the possibilities would be, which is that the distributor could control who got to work on these films and how much the budgets for them could run. Charles Mintz demanded that Walt take a 20% budget cut for the series and reminded Disney that he owned the character and revealed that he had already signed Disney's current employees to a new contract behind Walt's back. The only animator who didn't sign was Ub Iwerks. Shocked at this revelation, Disney refused the demand and quit. He boarded the train, now without a character or staff. But the long ride home was the road to a new future. Well, the, of course, the legend is that Walt was back in New York when he found out he'd lost Oswald, and on the train on the way home, there was a mouse or something, and he said, well, I've got an idea for a new character. Over the next two weeks, animating at a record speed of up to 700 drawings a day, Ub Iwerks worked in secret to give life to a new character, Mickey Mouse, with features and actions much inspired by Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. You can kind of look at Mickey and say that's Oswald with round ears and kind of doing a lot of the same things, although I think Mickey took on a little bit more of a personality than Oswald had. Oswald was a little more just a character to play gags off of, and, and Mickey had sort of his own volition a little more. But uh, there's a very definite relationship between the two of them and, and the, the style they're drawn in. And of course, we know who was drawing them, <laughs> and it was the same guy. And, and so it figured that the, the style would be similar. As of February 2006, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit is back home where he belongs at Disney. And after nearly 80 years, Oswald will enjoy his reintroduction to animators and audiences around the world. Everybody was so excited about it, and it, it shows a real pride in the company and for all that are a part of it, and every Disney fan. In a way, Oswald and early Mickey shorts, too, are great lessons, I think, for animators. The whole animation department's really curious to see this stuff and get a, a little more of a sense of where they came from. To bring them back and to see that much further back into our history, it's really fun to add all that historical material back to, to our own company and our own heritage. Thank you.